Hi everyone, thanks for stopping by Pete's Garage. This video is all about air compressors. So whether you're shopping for an air compressor for the first time or you've had one for quite a while and you need to go out and buy a new one, the marketing information you run into when you go to buy one is just mind numbing. There's 40% more runtime, two times longer life, 50% quieter, 300% more runtime. So when you walk into a store and start looking, you are bombarded with marketing and advertising. Now, in order to make it easier for you, I went and did that for you. I went to all the big box stores where people would normally go to buy an air compressor, and I looked around. I went to Home Depot, Lowe's, Tractor Supply, and Harbor Freight. To help make it easier for you, I'm going to break down and share with you the three types of compressors there are and the seven hows I developed while looking at all these compressors. The seven hows that will help you choose the best one for you. First, the three types of air compressors. The three types you're going to find are diaphragm, piston single stage, and piston two stage. Each one of these has its own pluses and minuses, so understanding how each one operates and how they function will help you choose the best one. Let's start with the diaphragm. The diaphragm air compressor has less moving parts in it, so it will be cheaper. It can come with a tank and without a tank. It has a very simple operation. There's a motor or a crankshaft that takes a diaphragm or a flat piece of rubber or a material and just moves it up and down. As it goes up and down, it sucks in air on one side, it'll shut a check valve, it'll compress it and push it out the other side. Now the pluses about this kind of compressor is they'll be a little smaller and a little cheaper. However, since the diaphragm has to move up and down faster in order to keep up with the airflow or to keep the tank full, it's going to run faster and it's going to be a little bit louder. And since it's running faster, it's compressing the air a lot faster. That air compression, as it pushes it into the tank or pushes it out into the hose, is going to create heat. So, small, compact, cheaper, but louder, and it will produce more heat. And the heat that comes out and goes into the hose or the tank, as it expands and cools down, if there's a lot of moisture in your air, moisture will accumulate in the tank or the hose. The next type of compressor is the piston driven single stage and it's called a single stage because there's a piston, it's usually two pistons, not one big piston to get the area, you don't want to have a big piston driving that up and down, so it's usually two smaller pistons that drive up and down and as they are driven up into the top of the cylinder, they compress the air, a valve is open and the air is compressed right out of there, one stage. Compression, 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 and that's how they work. That's why it's called a single stage. It does it all in one shot. The pluses for a single stage compressor is that since you have two pistons compressing air, it can usually compress air faster in larger volumes, and it can keep up with tools that use a lot of air. It can produce a lot, of, a lot more SCFM. We're going to talk about that in a second. The downside of it is, is since you are using two pistons and you're compressing air a lot faster, there is going to be some heat there. They can be a little more noisy and there's a little more uh, moving parts. So there's more to maintain the piston, the crankcase, and the motor. So the motor, you need a little stronger motor to drive two pistons and uh, it can be uh, it's going to be a little more expensive than just your regular diaphragm type compressor. Next is the two-stage air compressor, and unlike the single-stage compressor, the two-stage compressor compresses the air in two steps, two stages. They're both, they're both driven by pistons. The single-stage does it all in one, but the, the two-stage compressor divides it up into two parts. One piston, the larger piston, is going to compress it to one volume. It's going to transfer it over to the other a cylinder and there's going to be a cooling tube on there as it cools over it's going to cool it down as it's compressed so you're put, sucking cooler air into the second stage that second stage will then push it up into a higher pressure the downside to the two-stage compressor is now you have two opposing pistons and that assembly and crankcase and all of that is bigger so it's going to be heavier the cylinders uh, the uh, tank you have the motor uh, the motor is can come a lot higher horsepower and it can be driven. Now, the two-stage compressor is going to put out 
uh, a little less SCFM than a single stage because it runs a little slower because you have p two pistons that you're trying to move. But since you have two pistons and you're compressing it in smaller amounts, one stage pr produces a, a certain amount of pressure and then the second stage boosts it up higher, two stage compressors can run 100% duty cycle. And I'm going to talk about that in a second. Uh, that means that they can run nonstop all day producing great air and you'll have no problem keeping up with your tools and they're rated for that. The motors are rated for it, the cylinders are rated for it, so a big plus to that is you can really keep up and you can run it non-stop without worrying about overheating your uh, the cylinders, overheating the tubes, or overheating the motor. So now let's talk about my seven howls you should consider when you're buying an air compressor. And the first howl being, how many CFM do your tools need? When you're shopping for an air compressor, you're gonna see two kinds of measurements. CFM, which stands for cubic feet per minute, and SCFM, which stands for standard cubic feet per minute. And here's the difference between the two. Cubic feet per minute is simply a measurement at atmospheric pressure, 14.7 pounds per square inch. I have a cubic foot of air. Right now, I'm, I have roughly a cubic foot of air here. No compression. If I take that cubic foot of air and I compress it to 90 PSI where SCFM usually measures at, I have a small packet of energy. I've compressed the air into a small packet and now I have a standard cubic foot per minute of air at 90 PSI. The SCFM is an important measurement for air tools because you should buy a compressor that can produce 1.5 times the amount of SCFM you're going to use. For example, let's say you have a tool that requires 4 SCFM. You take the 4, multiply it by 1.5, and you should buy a compressor that can produce at least 6 SCFM. The next how is how often will you use it? And this is a big one because if you're going to use it every every day, week, month, year, however often you're going to use it determines what size you're going to buy really uh, aside from the tool usage because if you're going to be doing some airbrushing and you have a small compressor you can keep near your workbench and just run a hose, no big deal. But if you're starting to get a, a bigger one, 30 gallon tank, something on wheels and you want to roll it in the corner, you're going to pull it out every time you need to put some air in your tires or use an air tool occasionally, then you need a storage spot for it. If it's going to be a bigger tank, 60 gallon, 80 gallon, 120 gallon tank, that's something that's going to be mounted to the floor, it's going to sit on the floor, and it's going to be a permanent fixture. So how often you're going to use it will determine what size tank you're going to get. Uh, and there's other factors with that, including uh, how much it's going to run. But the size of the compressor and determining how often you're going to use it. If you're going to take it to a job site, you can get away with a small uh, pancake compressor, diaphragm type compressor. That's also a consideration. So how often you're gonna use it should be a consideration in determining which size and which type. The next how is how long will you be using it or how long will it run? And this has to do with one thing, the duty cycle. The duty cycle is how long the compressor will be running in between fill-ups. Some compressors are designed to run all the time, but for example, let's say you're running an air tool and you look at the clock and the air compressor comes on every two minutes and it takes 30 seconds to refill. That means it's off for 90 seconds and it takes 30 seconds to refill. That gives you a duty cycle of 30%. Now if you're using a tool that requires 4 SCFM and your compressor puts out 4 SCFM, that compressor is going to be running 100% of the time. Now some compressors are designed to run 100% of the time or 100% duty cycle, long lasting 100% duty cycle compressors, but they can be considerably more expensive. The next how is how much voltage do you have available? Most houses are wired with 110, so if you buy a smaller pancake type compressor, diaphragm compressor, maybe a very small single stage compressor, you can get away with using 110 volts. However, you have to look at the current that the motor will draw. For example, if you buy a small compressor and it requires 10 amps, and you're plugging it into a 110 outlet that is a 15 amp circuit, you're gonna see the light flicker if the light's on the same line. You'll see the light flicker, and while your compressor's running, if you plug something else in and use another power tool like a die grinder or, uh, or something like that, as soon as you pull the trigger, you're gonna blow a fuse. So understanding 
how many volts you have and how much current is on the circuit will help you decide what you're going to do with your uh, what kind of compressor to get. Also, be very careful about using extension cords. An extension cord, the longer you run the extension cord, the extension cord is going to take up some of the power. It takes more power to get through the extension cord and it'll heat up and it could be a problem. As a matter of fact, some compressors will say plug directly into the wall. Do not use an extension cord. The best way to really hook up a compressor is with 220 volts. If you're going to have a bigger compressor, 220 volts is the way to go. And if you're lucky enough to have a 220 outlet in your shop or garage, really that's the best way to go. Or if you have the ability to wire it yourself, you can run a wire from your fuse box, uh, usually 30, probably a 60 amp fuse, running it right to your shop, have uh, power right there, or run the wire directly to the compressor, tie it right in, uh, wire the electrical right to the compressor, no outlets, no switches. That really is the most efficient and best way to do it. Next, how will it be stored? Is this something you can store underneath a workbench? Is it something you're going to roll into the corner? Is it something you're going to permanently mount to the floor? Is it something that needs to be portable? Maybe you need to mount it to a work truck. Maybe you need to carry it to a job site. Maybe you need to uh, carry it around wherever you go. That's a big con consideration because if you need uh, more air and you are going to carry this thing around, you're not going to want to buy a huge floor mounting compressor when you need something with wheels that you can roll around. Or if you're only going to be doing it working on a job site using nailers and staplers, you only need a pancake type compressor which makes it very easy to move around, very easy to store, and very easy to transport. The next one is a big one. How loud will it be? Compressors are rated on the scale, the decibel scale. It can go anywhere. I've seen some really quiet ones down to 50 decibels, which is very quiet. Right now, I'm probably talking about 60 or 75 decibels. And the louder you get, it's a big consideration because some compressors, compressors will run at 90 decibels, which is considerably loud. Your car is probably around 85, 90. Just to give you a frame of reference, uh, a loud rock concert, really, really loud rock concert, is probably around 120, 125 decibels. I think the loudest concert recorded was like the Who, it was like 130 decibels. Now, at 160 decibels, your ears will start to bleed, and if you are expo exposed to noise of 200 decibels, it can kill you. So noise and how loud it is is a big consideration, especially if... You're someone who's going to store it in your garage. You're going to you're in an area, or in the summer, you're going to work on it with the door open. And if you work second shift and you like to come home and work in the garage, as soon as you walk out there at one o'clock in the morning and flip on your compressor, and it's 90 decibels, I have a feeling you're going to get a visit from the police because your neighbors are going to complain that there's a guy working outside and his compressor is really loud. So the the how loud it will be becomes a really big factor when you think not only about yourself and how you're going to be exposed to the noise constantly, which can get really, really annoying if it's on, if it comes on every three, four minutes and you hear that compressor running, it's annoying. Not only that annoying to you, annoying to your neighbors, annoying to whom else. Unless you live way out in the sticks, it doesn't matter. You can get a gas-powered compressor. You can run it all the time, no big deal. But really consider how loud it is. Look at the decibel rating and choose one that's uh, appropriate for your shop. Now, if you're going to mount it somewhere where it's going to be closed in another area, in a basement, something like that where you're not going to hear it, it's really not that big of a deal. But if it's something you're going to store in an area, use it outside, use it in a garage. The garage acts like a big echo chamber. So whatever noise you hear inside the garage is going to be amplified when it goes outside and you don't want to upset your neighbor. So, so just consider how loud it's going to be. Our final how is how easily can you get spare parts should you need them. Now, of all the places I visited, Harbor Freight was the only one that had spare parts. They had spare compressors, single stage, dual stage, and they had spare motors. Now, I don't know if they have spare parts because the compressor breaks more often, but at least they're available. In a pinch, if you're doing a job, you need a spare part, you can run there and get a spare part. Uh, now, it's very deceiving, and you think that I buy a compressor, I can always get a spare part. Not necessarily true, because most of the parts, so you think about it, there's three parts. There's a tank, there's the compressor part, which is the piston or a diaphragm, whatever there is. There's that assembly, and there's a motor. And they're not all going to be made in the same place. For example, Ingersoll Rand advertises their compressor as assembled in the United States. Well, that really means they just put it together here. The compressor itself, the assembly, is made in India. The motor is made in Mexico. And the tanks, who knows where the tanks are made? Most of the compressors I looked at, the motors are made in China. 
which might make it difficult to get a spare one if you need it, if you can't find one locally or find one somewhere in the United States. Motors are a completely different animal when you're trying to find a spare motor. If your motor burns out, it can be tough to get. And the reason it's tough to get is because the mounting plate on the bottom might be unique to that compressor. And if you can't find the right uh, motor with the right mounting plate on the bottom, it's not going to fit and it just is not going to run right. Uh, also, uh, spare parts like valves, regulators, and I have found personally, the only part I've ever had to replace on a compressor is the switch, the pressure switch. Uh, that's the switch that activates when the pressure drops below a certain uh, PSI in a tank. It, it turns on the switch and it may tar starts your compressor. I only had those burn out maybe two or three times on me, but the good thing about that is the, the hole or the threaded hole on the tank where that switch goes is usually a standard thread. So you can buy a uh, you can buy a standard pressure switch, screw it in, hook it up, and it will usually work. You have to put in, uh, so, uh, there's an airline that runs the compressor sometimes, sometimes they're unique. But I know you can't really go to the store, look at the parts, a lot of the vanity covers cover up, you don't know where the parts are made, you really don't know. But before you buy it, just before you make that purchase, lay down your credit card, lay down your hard earned cash, before you do that, get the model number of the compressor, Go home and do a quick web search and just look up parts for DeWalt DPW 1415 and see if parts are available. That's going to help you a lot because parts can be very difficult and if you sink six, seven hundred, maybe twelve hundred dollars into a compressor and something breaks and you can't get a part, you just kind of threw away your money and, and, and nobody ever wants to do that. So check it out, make sure parts are available. So those are the types of compressors that are easily available to most people. You know how they work, and I gave you an idea of what you should be thinking about when you go to buy one. I hope that helps you. Good luck buying. Thanks for stopping by Pete's Garage.